Sheath underwear has ruined my life. Let me explain. The other day, I went to grab a pair of underwear and I realized that all of my sheath were in a hamper. So I had to resort to wearing one of my old boxer briefs, super low hanging, uncomfortable. Took a shower, put those on and try to get some work done. And I couldn't get anything done. I couldn't concentrate. It's ruined my life. I am now spoiled. I can't live without sheath underwear. It's a life ruiner in the best way possible. In the same way as that one person you met in high school that you fell in love with and you were bringing them gifts and trying to make them fall in love with you and just couldn't live without them. And you know, and then you see them with the prom king or queen and it just ruins your life. But also you got to experience all that love and now you're a stronger person. That's what sheath underwear can do for you. It'll ruin your life, but make it better in the end. Go to sheathunderwear.com, use my promo code RRBG, save 20% and change your life for the better. It may seem like trouble at first, but it'll be worth it. First off, I'm gonna do a little business. Thank you, Kilcliff, keeping me energized during these uh, podcasts. They are uh, delicious clean energy drink i don't know if you've seen them i don't know if they have them in florida but um, the joe rogan's part owner of the company and they just do a lot of clean vitamin filled energy drinks that don't have that stevia flavor that disgusting like artificial flavor but anyway they send these to me all the time and i appreciate it Mm. anyway what's up everyone welcome to the rrbg podcast i am here with Potentially one of my favorite guests of all time. Uh, to this day, the coolest boss I've ever worked with. Joey Redner. How are you doing, brother? I'm good, Eddie. It's good to get to talk with you again, man. Yeah, it's been a while. Well, actually, it's been a we, we, we hung out a little bit on a on a Zoom happy hour thing, which was kind of weird. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of a lot of the beer reps were like, You brought Joey into this? I'm like, Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but for those that are listening and watching and are not aware, uh, Joey is the founder of Cigar City Brewing, um, one of, you know, my number one brewery still to this day, even though I don't get to drink it as much anymore here in LA, it's distributed out here. But, uh, by the time I get my hands on a, on a six pack of high lie, it's four months old and you yeah. spoiled me. So yeah, it's well traveled. Yeah. You, you, you're, you know, the, the Cigar City uh i guess education system spoiled me to where i can only drink high life if it's like a month old <laughs> I, i'm probably not supposed to say this but I, I i mean when you have fresh local ipas i don't i don't know why you would drink a lot of ones that that got made very far away yeah uh, yeah there's that too yeah fairly close to, to california now i think we're making we're making it in texas and colorado texas and colorado okay well, I knew the I knew Colorado because of the Oscar Blues thing. But. Right. Yeah, let's say they have a brewery in Texas. Well, we and we've got Deep Ellum is in our group as well. So, mm. and Three Weavers, right? What's that? Three Weavers too. Three Weavers, but we're not making beer out there currently. Mm. Okay, is that a plan? Is that part of the plan for the future? Uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to say. Um, you know, when you start trying to flavor match things, uh, and you you know just getting them getting it synced up can be difficult. And you know, we've gone sort of one one brewery at a time. Yeah, LA water is not the best. <laughs> well, it's Tampa water's uh that's nice in the winter, but it's it's uh in the summer. We, I I'll put our water up with anyone is not being good. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird though, man. I I guess cuz I spent so much time with it, um uh, selling it and drinking it that I can identify Florida water when I drink a beer and it it feels it feels unique enough to where I, I would prefer it over anybody else's water, maybe except yeah. Colorado, you know? Yeah. I, you know, it's like anything, you, you know, and now the technology, you can make the water anything you want virtually. That's um, true. But if you're going to work with it sort of as a, you know, as a terror element of, you know, like, Hey, this is what our water is. Then you just sort of build the recipe around it so that, you know, it can, it can benefit from, from what might be a shortcoming. You know, I think it's one of the reasons Florida makes really good stouts is because we have hard water and helps yeah. build that big mouthfeel flavor profile. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, to, to this day, I think the best stouts I've had are out of Florida between you guys and, you know, JWB and, uh, you know, a couple of the other uh, great Florida breweries that are out there. But, uh, you know, I was looking for stuff to talk to you about. Like, I have a lack of stuff to talk to you about, but uh, I just like to be prepared. But I, I found an article. It's like, Cigar City founder Joey Redner selling his mansion. What's up? I think mansion <laughs> is kind of a grandiose word for it. Um, it's, uh, you know, I bought it and we liked it, but 
uh, you know, I think it was almost sort of a, a check the box kind of thing. Have a house on the on the water. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm much more into the urban sort of downtown public transportation, being able to walk to things lifestyle. And, you know, we, we were lived, we were there about five years. Um, and it was kind of a long term plan to sell it and downsize as the you know, kids got older. But uh, we just sort of accelerated it. And all the cool things that are happening in downtown Tampa. Um, you know, we found ourselves down here a lot anyway. Um and we just sort of, you know, we just started kind of, my wife started looking and one thing led to another and looking came to screw it. Let's just do it. Um, so we, we moved, you know, we, we, we moved before we had any plans to sell the house. Um, so it happened pretty quick. Um, and I don't, we're, we're very happy. Um, you know, I don't, I don't love paying, uh, paying to upkeep two properties, but that's why we've got it for sale. But, uh, yeah, it just, you know, it just, it kind of happened suddenly. And it's, you know, it's like we, we, I made the decision probably more emotionally to move there than really with my head. Cause you know, I, I like being on the water. I like being near it, but I'm, it's not like I'm a fisherman. It's not like I'm, you know, I'm out there every day uh, on the boat. So, you know, it was kind of a, it was kind of nice, but a waste. Right. Um, so I figure I'll get, I'll get out of there. It's, it's a beautiful house built in 1925, which is by Florida standards, historic. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll get out of the way and let someone else get in there that, you know, that hopefully is a fisherman, a boater that'll enjoy it more. How about the option of like renting it out to hot, like film producers and stuff like that for shots? You know, it's funny you say that, and I don't know if I'm allowed to say it yet. Uh, but they literally just filmed a commercial there uh, for a guy that recently played in the Super Bowl. I guess I'll leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they just did it a week and a half ago. They reached out to want, uh, for a shooting location um, for sunglasses. Uh, uh, Danish sunglasses. I guess I'll leave it at that. That's <laughs> why we were told not to say anything. Well, speaking of sunglasses, I looked up your Twitter and it's like Ray Bans. That's all it is. Your Twitter account uh, is oh, all Ray Bans. Yeah. So my Twitter <laughs> got hacked, but my email is it's on the Cigar City one, and they ported everything over to Outlook. Mm. It's not on Google, so I can't get a password reset. So I'm just, I guess I'm just happy to be the. Uh, the, uh, the the Twitter Ray Ban guy. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it could be what something worse than Ray Bans. I true. Suppose. Yeah, true. You can get you can get yourself canceled. Uh, but, yeah, uh, I got. I still got my Instagram and I still got my Facebook, but apparently, because I never, I wasn't on Twitter a lot. You know, I I dabbled in it. Uh, I pop in occasionally. So I started getting texts from people saying, "Hey, you, you got hacked," and I, so I tried to reset it, but the password is going to basically a dead email link right i'm sure eventually i could do enough work to get it ported over to the other system but uh, i haven't cared enough i guess if i guess if they start putting dick pics up there <laughs> and light a fire and I'm <laughs> yeah yeah no i hear you man i barely use twitter it's my lowest uh priority i guess with with the podcast like promoting the show and everything yeah um which i i don't know i mean i'm sure it's a mistake i'm sure there are people making money off of twitter uh numbers but yeah oh, it's well. a, it's got a different vibe than the other social media and it's much more you know just being more text-based i know there's photos now too but um it just doesn't lend itself to me as well as 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 some of the other ones um but i mean i see you know for quick for quick just getting a thought out you know obviously it's it's unparalleled at that because it's you know it's by its nature you've got to be concise um that's what i mean you know so i it, you see a lot of comedians use it for one-liner jokes it works really well for that yeah, yeah. Um, but you know uh, instagram i think when if you're trying to promote something seems to be much more um so sort of the preferred platform yeah man um so i want to dig a little deeper with you um you know we've known each other for a few years now we work together at cigar city uh you know and like i said at the top like coolest boss i've ever met coolest uh, millionaire i've ever met i'll tell you that much <laughs> thank you it happened by accident <laughs> <laughs> much like a sour beer it happened by accident <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, because usually when you hear about people making millions, they're usually kind of like unreachable or douchey. And, you know, w one of the images that's burned in my skull is you crowd surfing at a ghoul show. Like, <laughs> you know, like that, that's awesome. You don't really hear a lot about millionaires crowd surfing at a, at a barbecue. So um, w you, tell me a little bit about that mistake. Like, how, how did that like, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I didn't, you know, I, I grew up, you know, my dad, you know, later in life, my dad, you know, he started making decent money, but, you know, he did it in an industry that wasn't, you know, wasn't considered, 
you know, so one in the in the socially acceptable category. Uh, right. I, mean, I didn't grow up with money. I mean, you know, my mom had me when she was nineteen. You know, um, uh, we were on food stamps when I was when I was really young. Um, I still remember, like literally, remember eating government cheese. My mom worked at HRS, but also was on food stamps while working there. Uh, you know, my parents split when I was young. I think I was like seven. Um, and my dad still wasn't making much money. Then later in life, probably in his mid forties, he started to make, you know, some coin, but he grew up, you know, dirt poor himself. And he, you know, he, he was born in the forties and, you know, was the, was the son of a single mother. And, you know, he turned 60, 16 to 1956. And, you know, socially he lived a very different, uh, life than, you know, sort of what was on TV at the time. Um, so I did, you know, I didn't grow up with a lot of wealth until sort of later in life. And even then it was, it was very new. You know, I went from a very hard, you know, very, you know, we moved around a lot, scrambled to make ends meet, you know, and I look back now, you know, well, we were probably moving a lot because we got kicked out. Um, but, you know, then, you know, later in life, my dad started to make a little money, but it was new. And, and so, you know, by then I kind of already had, you know, I already, you know, my, my formative years were already what they were. And, and I still, you know, when my, you know, I, I still for a while, it was like sort of a dichotomy because I'd live with my mom and we did not have a lot of resources and, you know, we live very hand to mouth. But then I would go to my dad, he was doing better, living better, but it wasn't necessarily flowing directly back to where I lived. Um, so I grew up, you know, I mean, I grew up not necessarily, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't miss mules. Um, but I didn't have, you know, a lot of things that my, that the other kids in school had that I wish I did. And, you know, I, 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 I had a little bit of shame, you know, like, so where I lived and want people to go to my house. Cause it wasn't, you know, I lived a block off Nebraska Avenue. If you're from Tampa, you know, <laughs> I lived at 109th in Nebraska Avenue. Um, you know, I could definitely see streetwalkers um, <laughs> when I was walking home from school. Um, so, but you know, so, you know, as I, as I got older, you know, and then I, I never made more than fucking probably 35 grand, my, you know, and, and until I was well into my thirties. Um, you know, and some of that was just, you know, I, I didn't seek to do it. I kind of gravitated to doing jobs that I liked as opposed to thing what, you know, what they paid. Um, but then, you know, when I found beer, just I, like, you know, I just found my place and I found a thing that, that I could do. And, you know, I, I would have done it if I continued to make 35 grand a year. Unfortunately, my wife, she, you know, she did pretty well. And, you know, if I could just work in beer, because, you know, I didn't start out in the brewery. I started out, you know, I was writing about beer. I was, I was working for another brewery doing sales. Uh, you know, they're not jobs that, that pay super great. You know, as you, if you get in with a good company, you can make a decent living, but you're never, you know, you're not retiring to Tahiti. Um, <laughs> right. You know, and, and, but, you know, I just, you know, I think came along at the right time, but also just, you know, I came about my love of beer very, you know, very honestly, um, just out of, you know, experimenting over time, just not liking what was available um, and just, you know, passionately wanting to see that in the city I grew up in. Um, I, you know, I got there early into the space and I think it helps that I have good people around me like you that like, you know, didn't, that wanted to be in the space too and didn't have a lot of other options. So you know, they could come and, and make trouble with us. And, and so with a lot of talented people working with me, I, you know, I, I just, I got, you know, in many ways I got very lucky. I mean, it's not, I'm not taking away from the hard work because there was, yeah, but it was fun hard work. Um, you know, and there were times that it was very frustrating, but, and that's why I say it was by accident because I didn't set out, you know, my goals on paper was that if, man, I could get my, if I could be making 50, 55 grand a year, uh, 10 years out from, you know, so by 2019, if I could be making that kind of money, man, that will have been a, you know, a major success. Right. Um, so, you know, it's it just like, you know, a lot of times and, you know, it, it helped too, because, you know, as I was growing the business, I didn't have high goals for my personal income. So it was very easy for me to, wow, making a lot. And I could just shovel it back into the business. I could buy more tanks. I could hire more people. Um, I could expand, you know, in there. Cause I didn't, I never set out to have high income goals, um, so it's not like I was, I needed that money for my lifestyle. Cause my lifestyle was, you know, I, again, I wasn't missing any meals, but it wasn't, it wasn't a, 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 a elaborate lifestyle. Um, but eventually you get, you know, it's like at anything, you have enough success, the money sort of follows and, and, you know, you, you sort of figure out what to do with it later. But, you know, <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, I take nicer vacations now. I, I have, you know, I have vacation homes now. I can do a lot of things that, that, 
you know, that I never dreamed that I would be able to do, but I still grew up the way I grew up and I still like the shit I like, you know, yeah, I'm yeah. still, I still cuss a lot in public settings, you know, <laughs> <I'm not laughs> right. um, and you don't so, you sip know, your beer with the pinky up. Yeah. Well, I do, but no, that's just genetic. I don't know why. It goes <laughs> out. It's funny because I was looking at a picture the other day and my pinky's just out. <laughs> fancy, fancy pants. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's funny. I, I, I when I, you know, I, I had an, a, a journey to Cigar City that I kind of like set it out as a goal. You know, when I discovered beer, I kind of, it, it was weird how it worked out, man. Like I, I. I was out at, at a at a burger place with my wife, and I remember seeing a dogfish head rep, uh, which I thought was a dogfish head rep, but he was actually a brown rep. Right. And I remember, not I didn't know anything about it. I had just started discovering craft beer from being on tour with the band. I found like Golden Monkey and you know Three Philosophers, and I was like blown away by this concept. And then I saw that guy, and I remember telling my wife, I'm like, I'm going to go talk to that guy real quick. I want to find out what he's doing. He told me, you know, I'm the distributor, and I drive around with this cooler, and we drink beer. I'm like, I want your job. <laughs> Tell me more. Yeah, I want your job. And the way wor life worked out, I ended up taking his route at Brown. Uh. So it was kind of, I felt bad, like a little part of me felt bad. I'm like, <laughs> I took that guy's job. I wanted it, and I took it. <laughs> And then it wouldn't have been there for you to take if he was do, if he was doing the best job possible. <laughs> I guess, yeah. There's that too. Um, and then you know, through Brown and through the the touring with the band, I discovered Cigar City. I remember having Highlight at a show we played in Tampa at some small like little bar, and thinking, "Wow, this is this is something." And I, I and then just made my way there. I could just how do I impress the guys at Cigar City enough to where they want to hire me? So. <laughs> Uh, and, and I remember the first day going to Tampa for, for, you know, training and you like meeting you and you were like, yeah, man, come to my house and watch the world cup. And, you know, I got some <laughs> extra clothes. I'm like, who is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, it, that, that really showed me the fact that you invited me over and we're, we're so welcoming and so kind of just cool about it, it, it. It really showed me that, you know, you weren't just like new money, like in, in that sense yeah. of like douchey new money, like you well, I, I, worked funny, for it. I literally was new money. <laughs> yeah, you were new money, but you had worked for it. You know what I mean? Like yeah. You you went through struggles in life. It wasn't yeah. like something was handed to you, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I had, I went to, you know, there were times in my life where I really, you know, I did have jealousy, shame, you know, like, you know, I, I didn't want people to come to my house because I wasn't proud of it. Um, you know, and, and looking back, I shouldn't, it shouldn't have mattered. Um, but you know, it's hard when you're 13, 14, 15 years old to, to be able to, to have that kind of wisdom to go, you know, it doesn't fucking matter. Um, you know, it, you know, now, now it doesn't matter, but now, you know, I, I can afford to do things that I couldn't in the past. Um, but I think, you know, some of, you know, that everything that leads up to where you are, um, informs it and it's, you know, it, you should be able to look back and, 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 you know, be proud of some of the things you did, but also know that, Hey, you know, where you were at that time, like, you know, you, you could have had more strength of character to be like, you know, it doesn't fucking matter. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's not like I'm beating myself up over it, but I do. I, I remember it not fondly, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I hear you. Yeah. I hear you. I've tried to, you know, the struggles that I've been through, I try to, I'm, you know, I'm getting to that part of my life where I'm trying to use it as fuel, you know, like, all right, yeah. I'm able to take people's jobs like that because that was what I had to do growing up. Like I had to kind of, I had to be on the attack you yeah. know? and, and um, you know, that's something I noticed when I moved out here to LA that a lot of the beer reps and, and people out here weren't, didn't have that hustle mentality that you get from the East coast from, from working like this, you know, pounding the yeah. pavement, as they say, a lot of people here were kind of slacking and, you know, it, it, it was weird. I, people were looking at like, why, why do you care? So I'm like, damn, I, I got to make money. Like, I, yeah. what, are you, what are we doing here? I'm not here to be homeless and <laughs> wish to become an actor. You know, like, that's not my job. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I did. I found the best beer sales guys, though, are the guys that if you paid them like money and they didn't and there was you didn't have to chart their sales, they would go to all the bars, get to know everyone know how the management was, know what beer they liked and know what they wanted to see coming across. Like those are the guys who always do well anyway, is the ones that are just, they're very friendly with everyone mm -hmm. and they get to know everyone. Um, and, and, and they become almost like, you know, a part of their work family. 
those are the guys that always slay it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's a, that's the thing I miss, man. I miss the beer industry. Like I miss the, that part of the beer industry. Cause I, I'm not obviously not in it anymore, but it was something that, that, that unity, that like family aspect, that social aspect of craft beer that really drew me in. Cause I mean, I was doing it anyway. I was having bottle shares at home just because right. I wanted to try cool beer. And, uh, the more you, you the more you learn about the industry, for me anyway the more i got into it and and when i landed at ccb it was more like more education even like us at nine in the morning drinking infected hellas lager like that <laughs> kind of shit so um it, it was good to learn and it was just kind of like perfect timing too like it was a boom in florida there wasn't really mm -hmm. a lot of craft and you guys kind of led that charge um to yeah, where timing is very important it's very important in anything uh, it doesn't doesn't mean you can't do it when the timing's not ideal but right. ideal timing helps yeah yeah and, and it was an explosion and and i always uh likened it to to being a rock star almost you know during that time period like you were a rock star if you were yeah, showing <laughs> you you were at conventions you were at jbf get given speeches and people you know asking you for pictures and like it's nuts yeah it's you know I, it's something that always seemed weird to me because, you know, but but then on the other hand, there are certainly guys in the industry that I felt a sense of mild awe about, you know, I mean, you know, guys like Sam Calgione at Dogfish Head, uh, you know, Ken Grossman at, at Sierra Nevada, Garrett Oliver, those are guys that I felt my little bit like, whoa, you know, yeah, like those those guys were cool to me. Um, so, you know, I, it, I still just, it's weird to apply to yourself, though. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just weird to think of it because I know me. <laughs> <laughs> like, are you guys sure? Because uh, <laughs> um, do, do you feel that 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 vibe is still going with the craft beer? Because like I'm disconnected, so I I yeah. obviously don't feel that. But no, you know, I think it's much less. I mean, you still have those. You have those old school, like you know, guys like Ken Grossman and and Sam. You know, they're always going to draw a crowd just because you know they're such legends. I think I, you know, it's it's become so, uh, you know, commonplace, ubiquitous. Really, craft beer. I mean, it's every, it's in every bar now. There's no bar almost, uh, even to your diviest dive bar, you don't carry at least one craft. And I think some of that has demystified it. You know, it's not, um, you know, it's it's nothing to get all excited about because there's a craft brewery damn near everywhere now. Uh, whereas before, it was like, hey, here's a thing that I really love that very few people are doing, and that guy does it. You, you know, you could get a little bit of that, but now it's just, you know, it, it's very commonplace, I think. And that takes some of the, some of the glitter and, and sizzle off of it, um, which I think is a good thing. Cause you know, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, and I, you know, I'm, I'm not really a brewer. I'm a brewery owner. I can brew beer. I know I, 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 I was a home brewer. I, I can make beer, but it's not really what I did. You know, I let guys that were way better at it. You know, I got the fuck out of their way and let them do. That. Um, I certainly had input and in things that I wanted to see tried um, that would have been shittier if I tried to implement them. But these guys would take an idea like that and know how to not fuck it up. Mm. Um, so, so in that regard, I think you know, like any sort of celebrity that comes from it, I think is, is especially when it comes to me, is misplaced because I'm really just a guy who owned a business and figured out how to make enough money come in without enough money going out. Um, and you know, it's, and I know for a fact that lots of people can do that because they do it at the corner hair salon, they do it, you know, at the, at the bodega down the street, you know, they, lots of people can do that basic fundamental thing. Uh, I just did it in an industry that at the time was very underserved mm -hmm. and there was a lot of pent up domain. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, I think it's a good thing for the industry that it just, we sort of just treat it like the profession that it is. And don't, don't get me wrong. There's artistry to it, there's skill, uh, and there's certainly craft in in the word craft um yeah. but there is definitely craft that goes into it but you know it's still it's still an occupation you know um whereas opposed to you know the reason i think you see a lot of rock stars get that you know that sort of you know rock star thing is because there's a level of artistry that makes you rise above whatever the craft is yeah you know yeah no i agree 100 percent. i mean I, I i'm kind of back and forth on that on that point you're saying where it's a good thing yeah we shouldn't have rock stars in the first place i think it's kind of a weird concept but uh but there is a certain level of admiration for the art artistry that goes into it when you're making really good beer because 
there's a, during that time we had that boom a lot of breweries started opening up and just because you can make a beer doesn't mean you should be because it doesn't really right. taste all and doesn't that mean good. that you can make a lot of it consistently over over you know a decade right yeah exactly so the fact that you guys had this history of making consistently good beer and and not, eventually eventually <laughs> and, but you had like the the mystique like the hunapu day and the you know the Canador club signups like all of that was kind of this like it felt special at the time and even you yeah. know for myself like uh, there was a trickle down residual rock star-ness to like for me me going to a show i mean the whole concept of this podcast started because i started going to shows with cases of ccb and people would call me the rock and roll beer guy they're like <laughs> you know what I, mean? I would show up like hey guys want a drink they're like yes so <laughs> I, they, they, I was the rock star for the rock stars like i would show up and brighten right. the, brighten the day yeah. and everybody was stoked and um i, I felt that i kind of it was kind of like a drug that's why i kept doing more and more like oh i want to you know what territories right. where do i go yeah. and uh it was the driving force to to making the thing grow and then eventually when i got out here i got super jaded because i noticed that that's not the case out here in la it, they've, been, <laughs> they've been doing it a lot longer here yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, nobody in la is impressed with anything no <laughs> um so so which is ironic because everyone's going out of their way to impress right <laughs> right everybody's got a script you can't go to starbucks without getting pitched a script for a movie or something um so where where do you see craft beer right now with all of this like the hype brewery nonsense that i see and and all the, like i sometimes see i have it on on instagram i follow a few breweries and i see like oh are you stoked about our new uh, vanilla chocolate IPA? I'm like, what are you guys doing <laughs> out there? Yeah. So, do you feel that that we jumped the shark a little bit? Like the burst, like the bubbles burst. You know, like for for years, I, you know, I used to say no, and it's good that these things exist simultaneously. That you can get a vanilla chocolate IPA, but you can also get you know a pale ale and these traditional beers that were hard to find before. And Bob Sylvester, who, who owns Saint somewhere, we used to kind of jaw back and forth about it. And I'd say, look, man, you know, making more people happy, is, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but fine, you know, it's, we're getting to the point where, it's, you know, the last couple of times I've gone to a brewery, I mean, it's like, you know, there's 12 things on tap, but everyone's an IPA, mm -hmm. or, you know, a variation of an IPA. And I mean, it's almost in some ways getting to where it's gotten so diverse that you can, you can diversify into such a tiny little lane that it's like, you know, one of the things I used to hate about beer in the 90s is I could walk into a bar and there'd be six tap handles, but they'd all just be a, a mass produced American lager. You know, they, 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 they trick you into thinking that it was something new, but Red Wolf is just all, you know, or, or Red Dog, it's just another lager that they put some dye in. You know? <laughs> yeah. they, they were not different beers, you know, and they're like, you know, Michelob, Michelob Light, Bud, Bud Light, that's really four different beers. All you've done is taken some calories out of a few. Style-wise, there's nothing different there. Yeah. Um, now you go to some really good beer bars or, or breweries, and there's one style on. And if you're not a fan of that style, um, you know you're you're SOL. And I, I, that sort of stratification of things, I don't like. I've always like, you know, the Cigar City. It, it's definitely reflective of what I've always tried to be. Is hey man, let's learn how to make all the styles pretty freaking well mm -hmm. um and let's not forget these styles that sort of led to where we are now let's not forget you know about pale ales and, and dunkles and you know english summer ales and things like that things that just you know that were that were integral steps along the way to to all the styles that we love now let's freaking you know let's you know and, and honor them in a way really by by keeping them alive you know what is you know ipa was a dead style i mean it was dead you you, you know there was a handful of places you could find an ipa in the 70s in in the u.s maybe nowhere you know i mean maybe some you know may, maybe you could sort of trick yourself into thinking something anger steam was doing was an ipa but it, it, it effectively was a dead style yeah um and we brought it back but you you know i don't i that pendulum i don't want it to swing so far that we that we almost stagnate in our in our specialization um so you know it's, it's nice to me when i see breweries that that do a wider variety and it's nice to see breweries that specialize i mean breweries that say hey we're just doing traditional german lagers that's cool um mm -hmm. and if it's one here and there it's great but when it you know it gets to be like every brewery is specializing in hazy ipas or or just pastry stouts um you know I, that's not something i love seeing or at least unless it's Unless it's spread out enough that, you know, that if in the market, 
because you have to understand, you know, every couple of years you're getting a new group. You know, the, you know, you start drinking at 21. There's a guy chasing you five, three, five years behind who doesn't know what he likes in beer yet. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you're not making a wide variety, I had this theory for years that I never if, if Budweiser and Miller had made a pale ale, a stout and an IPA as loss leaders. If they had just made them and put them in the market, even if they like barely made money or even lost money, I never would have got into beer because I would have picked one of those up, drank it and been fucking happy and never searched, never looked for more, never tried to figure out how to make beer, how, how to start my own brewery, because I would have been a satisfied enough customer to not seek. Mm. And that's why I worry that we, we can stagnate by stratifying, by, you know, we get so specialized that, you, you, you know, you, you don't satisfy enough of the market. Um of course, I guess the reverse of that is if you do do that, then a whole nother wave of people will come and fix beer again. <laughs> so I guess yeah. I should not worry about it. <laughs> cool. Yeah. I just talked myself off a cliff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I hear you. It's that mentality of, of uh, you know, just like when people, that's what creates, I guess, artists where they see all the, all the movies I watch suck. So I'm going to make my own. Like that kind yes. of, you know what I mean? Yeah. Or, yeah. M- yeah. Food, movies, music, beer. Liquor, wine, all of that. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, man. I get, I get, I, I get kind of troubled in my in my own head where it's like, oh god, I hate that I'm seeing these beers that are not beers. Like that's not beer to me. That's a daiquiri, or, yeah. or that's a cocktail. What are you doing? But at the same time, like you said, if if it makes somebody happy, then what? Yeah, I want it. You know, I want. That's the thing. I want. You know, I want. You know, I want the big ten. I want there to be room for everyone's flavor in there. Um, even if it's things I wouldn't necessarily like, I, you know, I figure if you have, if you're a big enough brewery with a big enough team, there's someone on your team that does like those things. Yeah. And then, and then that guy should be in charge of making that thing the best it can be. Yeah. Yeah. I remember seeing some crazy styles I'd never even heard of, uh, or that I hadn't seen outside of a book, like, uh, at, the, at our tap room, uh, ESBs or, you know, Dortmunders yeah. or yeah. <laughs> Gruits. Well, you know, we, we, we made a lot of crazy beers too. We made, you know, we certainly participated in the, in the, you know, the, the pastryfication of, of beer and, you know, putting, you know, putting things sweet in, in big beers and, and, you know, really, throwing in a lot of adjuncts but i you know I, if you look at at our history and you look at what we brewed over time we've always done just clean simple old school true recipe beers we never stopped doing that we and we did it the entire time yeah so that passion I think it's that, important. that passion and that fire that you have right now like do you still because i remember when when ccb first started you were in there you were there every day and you know uh, are you still like that now that since it's moved on and Oscar blues has taken over, like, do you, do you feel involved as much or are you focusing now on other projects? I'm, I'm mostly focused on other projects. In, in some ways I've come, I've just come back to being a beer geek. Um, and I don't have to think about the business side of it as much, which is maybe why I pay more attention to, you know, I mean, I, you know, I, if your brewery has got 12 IPAs and it's keeping the lights on, then fucking tell me to shut up, you know? <laughs> I mean, but, right. you know, but I, I feel like if you, you know, you could have 11 pay the bills and then throw on a pale ale or an ESP too. Right. Um, but yeah, I've gotten much more, much more to being a beer geek. So in, in when we sold, we sold, I still own equity. And in the early days, I was very involved, uh, but it was always kind of my goal to step back. I mean, Cigar City is a different beast than what I set out to, to create. And it's definitely not in my wheelhouse to, to to do much for it at this point you know i think i put my dna into it and it's helped it kind of stay true to itself um but i'm just not i don't have the skill set to run something like cigar city brewing as it is but we didn't but cigar city cider wasn't part of it and i I spent a lot of my time there i mean i just about you know five days a week i'm there um anywhere from just sometimes a couple hours but sometimes i'm there all day um so and i'm a lot more hands-on in that um and I got a lot more projects going. I've opened a contract brewery in, in Largo, so I'm brewing for other people. And that's just something that kind of grew out of me contract brewing my beer and just finding a lot of things I didn't like about the industry and how it was done. Mm-hmm. Um, and I got the opportunity to, to do this. And so we're, we're brewing for other people. I also you know, brew products that I've invested in there. I brew my cider there, other breweries that I'm invested in. Um, and then I've made a lot of small investments in other breweries. Just, you know, some of them almost, some of them almost, just to the sort of angel investor kind of level of like, I don't know if I'll ever get anything back out of them, but I want to see, I like who's doing it and why they're doing it. Mm. Um, and then, you know, some, you know, some of those have not paid off. Some of those have paid off dumb well, you know? Um, but yeah, I'm still very active in the space and it's, you know, it's because I'm in the industry, you know, I hear about a lot of things and, 
Um, so, you know, I, but as far as, you know, actually being day-to-day ops in a brewery, I have a lot of investments, but I always invest in people who could do it with, if they did, if I wasn't involved, because right, <laughs> um, right, right. they need me, I don't have the time to help them, you know? So sure. if I'm going to, you know, I've invested in angry chair. They, they don't need me to ever step foot. There. Uh, magnanimous, which recently opened here, uh, you know, Charlie Mears and, and, and Mike, like, they don't need me in that building. It's, you know, if they need to call me on something, I'm available on the phone, but they're going to do fine without my input uh, because they've worked alongside me. You know, they, you know, they've seen as much of the industry of I, as I have. Geiger's um, out there now too with them, right? With Magnanimous. Yeah, Geiger's working with them too. In fact, I, I, I had like a three hour lunch with Geiger the other day. Nice. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, I'm, I, I'm involved in other projects where, you know, where, uh, so rock brothers, I kind of came into that late. Um, uh, and I've had to be more in charge there just because, you know, they didn't have anyone on, on the beer side of things. Nick Streeter, who used to brew with us, he's brewing over there. We act- actually just got our certificate of occupancy yesterday. So, nice. um, it's about, it's been a long time coming, but we'll start brewing beer there soon. And that's caddy corner from cider so i can walk over and you know kind of touch both of them and be there and check with with what's going on um but yeah mostly i am still very passionate about beer um i'm just you know not having to run uh, you know with cigar city there were times while i loved it uh i felt like i had a tiger by the tail i was happy to let go (laughs) okay okay man i remember i remember running into you uh 2014 the infamous uh Hunapu. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I remember just like looking at you with my eyes like wide open. You're like, take your shirt off and get yeah. out of here. I'm like, oh god, what's happening? Uh, but yeah, yeah, that wasn't that wasn't one of my fun days. <laughs> <laughs> so y- there's been some some in- interesting challenges that I could see. Like if I were in your shoes, I would be like, man, I'm I'm glad that I'm out of that situation. Then I don't have to. You know, like you said, keep holding the tiger by its tail. That's yeah. nuts. Um, Rock Brothers is something that really interests because we met up not too long ago at Three Weavers and we talked a bit. Yeah. But that's something that I've been wanting to to bring to the forefront because some people are doing it. Like I know KCBC does a lot of it and, and like Three Floyds obviously does a lot of the beer collaborations with bands. But I feel like there's that's a space that's getting bigger. You look at bands like Megadeth. And, and, you know, 311, obviously, with Rock Brothers. But uh, that's something that I feel could become a thing. And and I want to help facilitate that because that was kind of the idea of the podcast. Like, let's bring in the beginning. It was a a band and a brewer. And let's let's talk. Let's make some beers, you know. Um, So is that is that kind of like the goal with Rock Brothers moving forward? Do you want to kind of make it grow into this big nationwide kind of collaborative (laughs) effort? You know, it's you know, it's. It, the, the, you got yes and no you, you got to find the right partner because you know it's the nature of beer you know you know how it is it's like you said about about highlight you know even if you get it out there now you know it's just not it's not the best that it can be mm-hmm. um even if it's brewed in colorado so it's hard to ship here all over the country unless you can direct ship it we've, we've kind of figured figure out some ways to do that um i I would like Rock Brothers to become a little bit more, certainly music inspired and do collaborations, but make them a little more limited, not necessarily year round, because it's just hard to maintain that. Mm. Um, you know, it, getting a beer in steady distribution where it's always available is difficult. But if it's if it's a special thing that comes, you know, every year in April, it's a lot more easy to maintain that. Or maybe you keep it on draft on premise, or if you do expand. And you open another because you know Rock Brothers is unique in that there's a brewery, there's you know high end cocktail bar, and then you have a you have a really nice you know listening room music venue upstairs mm. um, that you know we get really good acts there. And so if you can if you can do it where it's it's sort of a, a you know a once a year kind of a bespoke beer that you make, or you keep it on draft a few you know for three or four months out of the year, I want to get it more to that, uh, and just and also just have more sort of musically themed beers that aren't necessarily band related. Um, but just, just that just sort of talk about things that are happening in music. Um, and so that we can do a mix and I, you know, I really want to expand what we do because, you know, Kevin Lilly, the founder, who's kind of segueing out of, of day to day operations, you know, he had sort of one vision and I would, I, you know, I, I have different musical tastes than he does. Uh, not that I don't like the bands that he's worked with. I do. I just have additional tastes and I would like to explore some of that. We, you know, we've been trying to work on sort of getting the, business the way it needs to be before we start new projects but i definitely would i'd like to do 100 percent. i'd like to do more metal but i'd like to do more punk too like i'd like to do a lot of things we're not doing now 
Yeah. And and there's so much room too, man, because not just, you know, music, but you can look at like, for example, a comedian, like you you love comedy too. Like you can have their own beers, you know what I mean? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, There's a lot of room to play there. I've had that idea. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I've always found working with you that that the collaborative nature uh, that's kind of like at the forefront with you, because even with me, like when I brought up ideas to you, like for example, the Guayabera, like we made that happen, and 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 look at where it went. Like I had no idea. Like at first, yeah. I just wanted it because I'm like, I want that beer again. Like I th- I want that beer that I can drink and uh, you know a nice solid pale ale with Citra. Like that's great. And then boom. It became, yeah. I mean, did it end up becoming your bestseller? Because I know it was like number two for a while. <laughs> it would battle, it would sort of battle back and forth between uh, Florida Cracker and and it. Um, and I don't know like, where it ultimately ended. And I now I'm sure with Hilo, it's probably trending down hmm. um, just because Hilo is sort of in the same wheelhouse. Gotcha. Um, but, you know, I don't that. know if it ever did peak at number two. Um, it, it may have, uh, but if it was, it, it would go back and forth. Um, you know, meanwhile, my favorite beer, Maduro, is probably never broke sixth. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's so not good. true. It was, the best, it was the best seller for for one for one month because it was the only beer we sent to the distributor for. <laughs> 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 and it's been downhill ever since. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny you mentioned the distribution situation with with having this like war, uh, nationwide collaboration because uh, that's something I do see a lot. Like when I see Deftones putting out a new beer, uh, they the comment section is all people like, "What the fuck? No beer in New York?" It's like, well, yeah, yeah. It's hard to get an, a double dry hopped IPA to New York in time for you guys. <laughs> yeah, so we. We've kind of got around some of that. There, uh, we we can do some shipping um, uh, through. It's, if I can say it, I'll say it. Um, yeah, it's it's called Bev B E V V dot com, and that's what mm. they do. Is they basically have they've sort of cobbled together a, a you know a, a regulatory framework that allows you to direct ship beer. Mm. Um, but it's only I think it's only like thirty something states, but it allows you to get a decent amount of beer. You know, when you have a band like Three Eleven, they do they have a lot of fans, but they are spread out. You know, and and so great if they're if they happen to be in Tampa, Florida, you can sell them a beer. But, you know, what if they're in North Carolina and they're not right. planning on coming for a while? So we, we're able to do some direct shipping and, and that's nice. But I do think, you know, the the model of it, you know, even Iron Maiden, as huge of a band they are, they have a beer. But it's, I don't ever see Iron Maiden beer on tap or really available anywhere. You know, I know they made it. It's the, the Trooper and it's a, it's a solid beer. It's made by a really good British brewery. But you know, I don't see it a ton, and it's the nature of the beer industry. Um, you know, if you could direct ship to an end consumer, you know, it, it, that would solve all the problems. But it's it's really it's expensive and difficult to do it the way the regulatory, you know, system is now. Um, so I do think, like, you know, you know, for for both breweries and bands, if you're going to make these collaborations, you have to look them as special things that maybe come back every once in a while. Um, you know, the, the, the collabs that we did with uh, skate park of Tampa, you know, those mm. are, those are usually one and done ones that we maybe we'll revisit occasionally. And I think that's sort of the best and highest use of the non-brewery, non-brewery collaboration. Um, you know, whether it be comedian or band or just another business. Um, right. cause I just think it's, you know, especially the, you know, it's, it's like you said, you know, if, if you make a beer for a band that's really popular and it's only in one area, you kind of just piss some people off. Yeah. You just make them angry. Yeah. So, you, you know, you got to have find a way. Yeah. Okay. Or maybe, maybe it's only available here, but it's, a, you know, it's available for this, you know, this special time of year, have, you know, have someone, you know, mule you some back. That's, is that, a, that's a phrase we only use in beer is mule. The mule. Well, <laughs> beer and drugs. <laughs> beer and drugs. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think that, you know, that sort of, that's where I think it sort of needs to be. Uh, it's just the nature of it. It's hard to, you know, I mean, what band is so big that you could you could have a, a nationally distributed beer? I mean, it, 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 that that was in every grocery store. I, right. I cannot think. I can't think of. You know? Yeah, we don't need that either. Like, I think yeah. maybe yeah. It, what needs to happen is the available. Like, what well, needs to, but what would be cool if if it's a band that's touring the U.S. constantly. If it's available at the venue, you know at what I mean? And we've, we've tried really hard to do that. And sometimes you can get it accomplished and it's nice when you can, uh, but other times it's difficult. Where I found it works really well is when you have bands that do cruises 
Mm. especially if they're out of Florida, obviously that works well for us, but even now I think you could do it, but it's very easy to get those loaded on so that it's available everywhere throughout the entire week of the cruise. And that way it works good for the band and for the brewery because there's some volume involved because you, right. you know, people on a, on a, on a music cruise for a week are going to drink. <laughs> they're going to do other things too, but they are, they're also going to drink. Yeah. And, and that way you can, you know, you can, you can make enough that it makes, you know, it, it, it has some meaning both for the brewers to do it and for the, for the for the bands because a lot of these things you know the, the goal is that you can split a little bit of the profit with it but and then the bands see it and then they realize oh my god you guys don't make any fucking profit on game <laughs> nope it's a volume play <laughs> yeah it's all yeah you gotta sell tons yeah. of it in order to make yeah i don't look at how much i make on a can i look at how much i make on a whole pallet of cases <laughs> yeah yeah a lot of people don't get those numbers man that, that was one yeah. of my part of my job and selling you know at, at, at bars is like explaining that to people it's like oh you know uh, how am i going to make money off of this ipa i need to sell it at at uh you know ten dollars and a, a pint i'm like no you don't but right. you could sell it cheaper and sell more more of it right and right. make a and ton then, of money <laughs> sit there going bad yeah. so that it's still there in two months yeah yeah i never yeah. understood that 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 conflict they're like no i need to mark it up to this but but like that's how i got away with um victory golden monkey i was selling like six half barrels a week at world of beer because they were selling them for five bucks a pint and it's a nine percent <laughs> beer <I'm> like, <laughs> do it. <laughs> that's how you sell man that's how you make money <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, 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 I know there's a lot of complexity when it comes to figuring out what you're trying to do with rock brothers. And, you know, it's, it's something that I'm getting more and more, uh, excited about again. Like that's, that's, what's bringing me back to beer. Cause I, I kind of, like I said, I moved out here and I kind of just got jaded and I'm like, I don't like what's mm -hmm. going on at all. But if I can start working with people like yourself to, to make, things like that happen i think that's that's yeah i that's know we, we talked about it a bit and I, i'd love to I, now that i feel like we're getting through the other side i'd love to bring it back up oh yeah. um yeah i really would because you know i i do think you know it, it, rock is a big word it encompasses a lot of styles and i don't feel you know I, we're basically you know we're, we're really in one tiny little section you know and and i really would like to expand that out um uh so yeah it's definitely something i want to explore yeah, now with the you know we're, we made it through the pandemic, uh, a lot barely, of people, barely. Uh, yeah, actually, things... you know it's funny because you know we we are a venue at Rock Brothers, so we did qualify for that save our stages. I don't know if we're ever going to get it, but oh, you know okay. that yeah that would be huge uh, if we can make that happen. Yeah, a lot um, of a lot of venues are closing down here in LA and all across the U.S. It's so, been tough. Yeah, yeah, and it's you know and it's uh, even if. It's not even if you want to be open, no one's touring. So, you know, mm -hmm. and we we kind of sit in that that space of, you know, people that have hit a level of fame that they're they're fairly well known uh, that, that maybe they do a stripped down version, you know, because it's a small venue. We can put up maybe 100 people in there and we really pitch it as like an intimate listening room. Mm. Um, and, you know. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> There we go. I didn't know that Zoom would cross if I got a phone call. <laughs> yeah. Are you still hearing me? Yeah, yeah, I hear you. You good? All right. Sorry. Hold on one second. I hope I didn't mess you up too much there. No. Okay. Um, yeah. So you know that that you know pre-COVID intimate was nice. Post-COVID intimate sounds like you're not social distancing. Mm. So well, it's been hard, and there's you know it. People are starting to book tours again, but it's it's really not till September, October. So we've still got to get through the summer, which is traditionally a bad time in Florida. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you know, and I, ke I kept hearing things like I would complain online about the, 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 Oh, I miss shows and people like come back to Florida. We never stopped having shows. I'm like, <laughs> Oh, we did. <laughs> I'm pretty we sure continued. no one's touring. <laughs> yeah. We still, we still had a few, but they, yeah, they were mostly locals. Like we had, um, JJ Gray, uh, it was, you know, he's in Jacksonville, but you have it at third capacity. So, you know, you're really not, you know, you, you, you're putting a band aid on, on a, you know, on a femoral artery, uh, right. bleeder, you know, it's not, it's, it's helping, but it's not, it's not going to change anything at the end of the day. Um, but yeah, you know, we're getting local bands and, you know, and you can't be at full capacity. So, you know, it does something. I won't say it didn't do anything, but it, it doesn't really help. Well, yeah, you got to think about having to pay staff for the bar right. and electricity right. and, and the band. And there's things you got to yeah. pay that and at the end of the day. And the hard costs that don't go away. I mean, you know, yeah. you still pay insurance whether you're 
doing business or not. You know, you rent. Uh, we never got rent abatement. You know, those things are those things are fixed. They're there whether you make a nickel or don't make a nickel. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, so, so moving forward, that's that's where you're gonna go. Um, do you still? I mean, are you still looking for new music? Do you still listen to, to heavy music? Because I know you're a fan of heavy music. Yeah, I, I do. Um, you know, it, it's it tends to be sporadic. Um, and it, 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 so it, my daughter is 13 now, and she's she's kind of been she's been like a vessel that I could pour a lot of stuff into. Nice. And she, you know, and so she, now she's throwing some of it back at me. Occasionally, she'll find music that that I haven't heard of. Um, she doesn't tend to go as heavy as me. That she will do some. Uh, but she she found this group called Mother Mother that I'm actually really starting to like. Um, cool. It's a little more poppy, but it's heavy pop metal, um, and and you know it, that's cool for me is because you know and and she's finding things like on her own that would have been contemporaneous with me, um, you know, like Green Day. I don't listen to a lot of Green Day. It's not because I'm a Green Day hater. I know it's popular to hate Green Day. It just just doesn't work a lot into what I listen to. But she has just on her own found them, and it's definitely not what other 13 year old kids are listening to. Um, uh, and it's just weird to me to, or like offspring. She found offspring on her own. I don't have offspring on my playlist. And then one day I'm, she's singing this song and, and I'm like, that's the offspring. And she's like, how do you know? And I'm like, Cause you're fucking 30 years old. <laughs> Cause we're contemporary age of age, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, man. Yeah. That's um, cool. Yeah. But you know, I, I still, you know, I Spotify will occasionally suggest new things like I was listening. So it's kind of like, I, they're kind of like Flog and Molly. I think it's called the the whales, the Greenland whale hunter or something. I forget what it is, but they kind of do this like punk metal, um, um, Irish, but but it's almost a little Nordic Irish. And I was listening to them today, and they were new to me. And they were just like a pop up suggestion. And they do they'll do really hard covers of um, of like older Irish folk songs. Oh, okay. And I, 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 that always kind of tickles me. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's good drinking music. Yeah. 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 Well, that's cool, man. I, I, yeah, I've, I've definitely, as I get older, I'm turning into that, you know, when I was a young kid talking to my dad, he's like, I only listen to this like stuff. Yeah. And, and I'm like, how can you not listen to new music? And I'm, I feel like I'm starting to turn that. Like, <laughs> like I can't listen to some of this new stuff that I, I, you know, comes across. Yeah, I, I still give a lot of new things to listen, but I do think I'm getting old in that less of it clicks. Yeah. I still try hard, but less of it clicks. Yeah. Yeah. Less of it clicks. I see more through the, like the, uh, stuff that seems to be forced to put together by a, by a producer or a label or something. I'm like, that's bullshit. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to spend yeah. any time with that. Um, they're just trying to sell you like a, a hot chick as a front, you know, as a front person or, or, or the dreads and the makeup, like, you know, it's, yeah. it's obviously fake um, compared to some of these, you know, I'll, I'll listen to like a, a local death metal band just cause I, if they're putting in the work, then why not? You know, I, sure. I, I want to see it happen. Um, yeah, but, but that's it's cool. funny. It's funny because you know I, I still will listen to some some you know what you know like I listen to you know like Death like the band Death now and it just doesn't sound hard anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I, I'm not sure quite when that happened. Right. <laughs> it does. Like I will you know I get nostalgic. I'll listen to some of the older stuff and it really it sounds almost melodic. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I don't know when, when that happened either. <laughs> yeah, it's just your brain getting adjusted to it, yeah. I guess, because you're so used to yeah. listening to it all the time that it's just normal. And, and I've I've found that when I try to show it to people too, I end up getting embarrassed. Like, like yeah. hey, like man, check out this song, and then I see them like, <laughs> what? Like, oh, uh, never mind. <laughs> Let's put something else on. I'm sorry, my bad. Um, and then things like things that I never that I didn't you know, like fear. Like I knew they were hard, but they actually sound harder now than they did when i was a kid mm. you know, like yeah. somehow they managed to sound they aged in they aged harder than they seemed to me then that's great that's great yeah, yeah. I, I feel that too with them for sure um yeah. do you let me ask you something before we go because we should probably go soon um the do you think we'll get back to like barbecue happening and stuff like that i don't i, I yes eventually um eventually but when and how and how close to that it's so hard to say like you know i think of little things like you know like and shit this is probably you know with with 
this is probably going out the window anyway, but I just really community coffee pots. I remember in offices, I was thinking yeah, a community coffee pot, everyone would get the coffee. You know, K-Cups probably started doing away with it anyway, but I mean, things like that are gone, like buffets. You know? mm-hmm. The bowl, <laughs> like how, the bowl yeah. of pretzels at the bar. Yeah, yeah. Like things like that, I think, you know, it, you're going to see some fundamental changes, but I really hope, you know, things like festivals as they existed prior where everyone's not in their own little bubble, I really hope that doesn't go away because I think that would be a real loss. I mean, if you know, we don't have communal pretzel bowls, I think the world will not lose much. Yeah. <laughs> but but if we lose festivals, you know, as they existed prior, I think that's a, that's a freaking real loss. Yeah, you know. So yeah. I, I I believe that they will, but uh, but even more than that, I'm very hopeful um, because yeah, it's just it, life wouldn't be the same, and I would hate to have to explain to my daughters like well, this is how it used to be. You know, like, yeah. here, watch now, this video. <laughs> yeah, now if you want to go to a festival, you got to put on a VR headset. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's rough, man. It's a rough. Uh, it, it, I do feel like we are at a time like one of those life changing times, like when when cell phones got introduced, where everything kind of changed. You know, mm-hmm. where like now you have the internet in your pocket when it's not this giant <laughs> machine in your living room. Like, yep. um, mm-hmm. I feel like that's going to end up happening too. like, we're, we're now having to adapt a whole new lifestyle. And like, I, you know, it's not, it, you hear people say it, the new normal, like that, that is a thing that it's, I don't know if we're ever going to get back to spitting on each other in a pit. You know what I mean? Like jumping around <laughs> and, and crowd surfing. Like I, I, I don't think I will feel comfortable enough. Or even with a vaccine. random guy by his ass. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. In the, woo, getting kicked in the face by a shoe. That's been like stepping in shit all day. You know, like, yeah. yeah. It, it, Spring it's flinging blood around. With, <sighs> got a contusion on your head. I remember <laughs> at one point I used to pride myself. Like if I wasn't, if I wasn't bleeding by the end of the show, I didn't have a good night. You know what I mean? <laughs> But uh, anyway, yeah. dude, uh, I, I'm gonna let you go. I know uh, your your time is worth a lot more than most of my guests. <laughs> yeah, this, is, this is all I was planning on doing today. Oh man, that's good. <laughs> uh, but I appreciate you, you know, giving me time. I appreciate you, just you in general, man. Like I said in the beginning, you're you're one of the coolest people that I've worked with. You've always been so welcoming and friendly, and and just down to earth, and and that's that's something I really appreciate. And you know, if CCB changed my life in a positive way. Like if it wasn't for the time I spent there, I, I wouldn't be where I'm at today for sure. Thank you, Eddie. I, I feel the same way, man. You've, you've always been really decent to me too. Uh, I, yeah. I hope so. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but <laughs> but uh, if anybody wants to keep up with you and, and your, your adventures, you know, what you're doing with rock brothers and uh, what's the best place to go to? God, there's no one central clearinghouse, unfortunately. <laughs> um, you know, uh, ask Eddie. He know he'll know what I'm up to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think your Instagram would be the best. Like, maybe I, I probably use Facebook more than anything now, but I don't. I just don't use. You know, I use it more than anything, but I just don't use social media as much as I used to. I Facebook, I probably will hit still once or twice a week. Okay. Uh, Instagram once a month. Um, I just don't do as much social media as I used to. Not really, you know, not for any specific reason. I just haven't. I think some of, you know, I, I don't even really know. <laughs> I don't know. I just, I'd say I'd say focus on the the projects that you're working on. Then. Yeah. So like fo- follow up with Cigar City uh, Cider and Mead. Yeah. So I guess Cigar City Cider and Mead. Um, there's uh, you know the uh, 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 Commerce Brewing. Uh, Commerce Brewing. Uh, if, if you if, you, if you're looking someone who will, who will treat your beer like 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 it's their baby too. Uh, Commerce Brewing. Uh, it's in Largo. Um, that's the contract the, brewing, right? That's the contract brewery. But okay. I get Tim Ogden, um, who, who would be perfect for you to bring on to this podcast. You remember Tim, who used to brew for yeah. us. He's he's opening Deviant Libations, and he's he, he's been doing. You know, he's been pushing for his own music. He's done music collabs. He did uh, one with Sam Black Church. Yeah, I remember um, that. You know, that. He's really pushed those, and uh, I think it was. Uh, he's done other ones too, but he, you know, he he's a musician. He he he's really into music and he brings a lot of a, the same approach to both both brewing and and he's, he's getting ready to open uh DV libations here in tampa um he's also brewing for us at commerce um he's a guy that you really should talk to i really think he, oh yeah he, yeah yeah I, I, know stay, you, I know you met him no i stay in touch with him on facebook he sends okay. me his music and stuff and i mean i've always been a i'm a big fan of his uh moat water from back yep. in the day you know yep. that was one of his creations so yeah. um but yeah i definitely should have tim on for sure yeah he was he's super into that like that 80s 90s like new england hardcore scene 
Yeah. Uh, he knows a lot of those guys. Hell yeah, man. Well, guys, yeah. keep an eye out for everything. Um, I, Joey, again, thank you for your time, brother. I appreciate it. I, I, it's always good to talk to you, Eddie, man. Same, brother. Cheers. Same. Cheers.